Hello, my name is Noel Kingsbury, and with my colleague Annie Garfoyle, we put on Garden Masterclass. We thought we should put this little introduction to Garden Masterclass together for those of you who've not come across us before, but have arrived at our YouTube channel. We aim to put on one-day educational events with the most creative and innovative people in the garden and landscape world up and down the British Isles, and that includes the Republic of Ireland. We've also started looking at putting on events on the European mainland, and this year we had one planned in France, one in Germany, and three in the Netherlands. Of course, our physical events this year are having to be rescheduled, but we're trying to do what we can online. Our events take place in garden environments uh, where there's plenty to look at. And here we've got Nigel Dunnett, for example, in Trenton Gardens, discussing with a group the planting he has put together there. Or Sarah Price, the award-winning garden designer, talking about using drawing as a design tool for Treberbiv Nursery in South Wales. Here, Marina Christopher, who runs a wonderful perennial nursery in the southeast of England at Parham House, talking about how she puts together perennials for effective planting design. And landscape architect and urban sketcher Liz Ackerley talking about using drawing as a design tool for people in the landscape and garden design business. Since coronavirus has constrained what we do, we've gone online. Increasingly, we are hoping to run uh, in-depth webinars. However, for the moment, what we're offering is every Monday and Friday at four o'clock London time, a broadcast, round about an hour, uh, with information, education, and some entertainment. We talk with somebody from the garden world, we look at what they're doing, perhaps sometimes we'll have a panel. So far we've had people from Britain, Ireland, Italy, and the United States. We've got plans to speak to people in Argentina, Ukraine, Lithuania, Japan, New Zealand. So we are pretty global. Our aim is to bring together gardeners all over the world to share experiences and see us through this difficult time. If you'd like to keep in touch, do please look at our website. Uh, or if you want to receive our occasional email newsletter, then do send us an email to gardenmasterclass at gmail.com and we'll put you on our mailing list, which of course will go no further than us. So we hope to meet you online and hopefully one day we may even meet you in the flesh. Goodbye, stay safe and enjoy this particular recording. Uh, lovely. Okay. And also just to say anyone who has donated and a lot of people have, thank you very much indeed. Um, we're very grateful and the, um, that's going to help us to grow and develop the online um, uh, shenanigans as we call them for, for Garden Masterclass. So thank you very much indeed. That's wonderful. Um, so I did put up a, a, a lovely photograph and somebody uh, from, that, that I found on, on, on the Alatex website yesterday of a beautiful uh, glass house at, uh, in the sunset. Um, and so I uh, gave a few little hints about, about our, our guests today. But before I introduce our guests, I just want to say that Alitex is a, a supporter of, of Garden Masterclass and has been um, a fabulous support for us for the last couple of years. Um, and uh, we work very closely with them and they've been very, very good to us. So we just want to say a huge thank you for that. Um, and today our guest is Chris Sawyer, who's got a very exciting title, which I'd like to have, which is Strategic Director. Is that right? Chris. It is, yes, yeah. yeah. Can I be strategic director of Garden Masters? I really like that title. I think it's one You're very welcome to, yeah. <laughs> my, yeah, I will explain exactly in more depth what I'm all about and my passion for what I do. But uh, Lovely, yeah. lovely. Um, and I just want, from a technical point of view, Noel, there's some people waiting in the waiting room. I don't know why, because we don't have the waiting room on, but if you could just check that, Noel. We have this, uh, Zoom has this rather tedious thing of keeping people in a waiting room. Anyway, Chris, sorry. Thank you, um, um, welcome, welcome. Lovely to have you lovely, here. Great, great, great coming along this afternoon and sharing something with you. Yeah, so, so what are you going to tell us about this afternoon? Well, I'm going to have a, a little bit of a, uh, a talk about what I've done throughout my life and then I'm going to take you straight into uh, the history of, 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 of where 
we get our inspiration. So uh, let me, I'm going to be reading a little bit off a script in the beginning, but you probably won't pick up on that. Um, it, and as I say, it's a great pleasure to be here and, and share my world with both you and our guest today. I'm proud to be part of a team of enthusiastic designing glasshouse people. And we live in a lovely location um, shadowed by the South Downs down in Hampshire. And anybody on the way down to Chichester can, is welcome to call in for a coffee. Um, Alitex has been commissioning fine glass houses with some amazing landscapes and, and parks over 60 odd years. The art of constructing fine glass houses was inspired by our predecessors who built, of course, in timber and wrought iron and cast iron. Companies such as Thomas Messenger, Foster and Pearson, uh, Mackenzie and Moncor, and other many timber glass house companies building structures at the turn of the 20th century. Alitex led the way when it came to using aluminium to recreate the original designs with our first Victorian designs being developed in the early 80s. And prior to that, we were building sort of functional aluminium structures. Our, forefather, our forefathers' um, great skills and their subsequent legacy has influenced Alitex very much over the last 60 years. We're still learning and reading about the great Victorian horticultural engineers and how they constructed such magnificent glass houses, many of which is, are still about today. We have a number on our radar at the moment, have some really exciting projects um, restoring in, in some fine glass houses. Um, and and that's, that's all part of the success of, of our business, really. Um, bear with me just a moment though, because I'm going to go very slightly off piste and, and, and relate to the way we all feel at the moment. Um, as I'm sure you agree, these are very strange times. Um, and fascinatingly, I have, however, been surprised to note that my obsession with the world of glass houses has been nudged to one side by my own garden waking up around me this spring. And I think we'll all relate to this, but as humans, we are very good at finding light when there is shade. In my case, and having, spelt, uh, having spent sort of six weeks self-isolating, I've had time to watch the garden evolve and indeed notice my wife's great skills in, in creating a wonderful horticultural theatre. She staged a show of plants and shrubs that have gradually exploded in a very clever pecking order during one of the sunniest and warm Aprils in the Yukon record. I think you all agree, um, our, our panel today, that it has been a superb April. Um, no frost, masses of flowers uh, on the fruit trees, providing a firework display of breathtaking colour. Nature has really put on the most spellbinding show as it blossoms forth in the UK this year. If plants could talk, they would rather cheekily state, what's your problem? We're just reminding you this is what we do every year and although this year we thought we would just add a little bit more support to help you through the difficult moment and and i would say this um i have found personally that uh, my business world has been traveling and building wonderful buildings and supporting people with um, structures and gardens this is the first year in my life where i'm starting to notice things within my garden, which I would have never noticed before. I would have said to my wife, Sue, that looks pretty. I've watched it grow now um, because I've been forced to stay in, inside this bubble. I can't say how much I want to get out. Anyway, so let's get back to what I should be talking about. I've got thousands of images from my travels over the past 50 years and have been blessed to have been invited to some of the finest gardens in the world. Um, also privileged to have been asked to build great glass houses in them. But I must also stress that whilst I'm a very passionate person about the subject matter, the success of Alitex as a world leader in glasshouse design is really down to the terrifically talented designers and manufacturing team that I work with. All, great, all the great cons buildings constructed are down to a talented team at Torbury Farm. And you're more than welcome, as I've said previously, to come along and um, have a look. So this is where we have a moment's pause where I'm hoping what I'm about to do will just fall straight into place and mirror my screens. Can you see that? Can everybody see that? Yeah, got that. Okay, so what I just want to do, I just want to move this out of the way. and I want to go back up to 
the start of this, which here we go. So I'm just going to run through some of the um, the images that have influenced my life. I have thousands of them, but I've just pasted it right down to just a few. So um, if we go to the the first set of images, um, obviously on the left hand corner, everybody recognises the great palm house at Kew, uh, constructed by. Richard Turner, um, under the designs of Desmond Burton, a real showstopper. And, and, and for those who've, who've been to London, a real great Christmas event. If you ever go there and go to the light show they put on, the, um, the star of the show is undoubtedly the Palm House. And uh, um, it's lit up beautifully during the winter months. The tickets, I must stress that the tickets are often sold out very early. Right hand side picture is quite interesting. It's one of Paxton, Joseph Paxton, who's a name we will all relate to with glass houses. Um, again, a Brit who's quite proud of being related to a hugely clever bunch of guys in the early 20th century designing horticultural buildings around our country. And we are the place, the venue for people to come and see them. But this was the, the great um, conservatory at Chatsworth. Uh, it's huge, 69 meters long, 37 metres wide and cast iron columns and laminated arch frames. It had a heating system on an industrial scale. Um, but sadly, after the First World, there was not, not enough coal around to heat the conservatory and many of the plants died. And due to the expense of restoring and maintaining the building, it was demolished in 1920. Now, I've been to Chatsworth and, and, and been in the Duke of Touches' office and seen um, this model which was put together by uh, an architect and and I've been told that the current Duke would have loved and still does to create this as a legacy um, but I fear that the budget might just be too high I will not go into the details it but many millions and whilst an emotionally commercially it just will not be viable um, this one has always been a showstopper for me and, and for those who know it, it's at Keeble Palace in, in the Glasgow Botanical Gardens, originally designed by John Keeble in the early 19th century and restored um, in 2007 at a cost of around £7 million by um, Shepley Engineering. And, and engineers, if you look at my cursor nowadays, would, would not endorse the engineering involved in spanning 200 feet and having a few posts all the way around the outside to hold it up. Um, but the Victorians really knew what they were doing and then finished off, it's stunning inside. If you're ever in Glasgow, head to the gardens and look at that. It's, it is an amazing structure. Um, next slide, another famous glass house down at Cyan Park. You notice know, curves are a big thing. They change the look of a glass house dramatically and create a very beautiful, um, uh, shape. Um, Alitex are just starting to apply that engineering. But whereas the Victorians would have done it with consummate ease, it has a big number attached to it nowadays using toughened glass and, and, and that sort of engineering. So it's a, it's a rare thing to do it. But we are getting close. And this is the home of the Duke and Duchess of Northumberland. Um, next slide is going to be a place that many of you will know and Westing. It's a lovely kitchen garden, a very old traditional garden. Looked after and cared for lovingly by Jim and Sarah for many years, friends of Alitex, and um, they've now retired. The gardens are now in the safe hands of Tom. Tom Brown moved from Parham, and uh, he's got a big act to follow. But um, I think you, for those who know the gardens, it's, it's such a special place. I'm going to be a bit commercial, but wooden greenhouses, Foster and Pearson, huge bills and, and, and budgets to keep them going all the time and if they had the budget they would replace them in aluminium but um, it's, it's, it's a lovely place and a great learning place to learn about the history of gardening. Um, this is a, a house in Scotland that I'm quite fond of uh, in Glen Burby up near um, Stonehaven, Scotland. Uh, it's the, the home of um, Alistair McPhee and, and you can see from the, the left-hand shot, it was the original pictures of the glass house back in the 60s. And Alitex went in there, and, and I'm quite proud to say that we did a pretty good job in recreating it in aluminium about 15 years ago. 
And the joy of all of these pictures that I'm showing you is, is that when you build an, a, a greenhouse classically as we do, your maintenance is um, washing. And, and um, at the grand old age of whatever I'm, I'm not going to disclose, and all of my years of doing this, um, the paint is still there and the buildings are still a long-term sustainable option to a huge amount of maintenance. So I'm now going to take you to, um, to what we call the Thomas Messenger system. Some, some years ago, this is a picture, a section through a piece of wood in our glazing bar, but some years ago we were invited to Ethrop, um, Ethrop uh, Estate near Waddeston, uh, and we were invited by um, Lady Mary, Lady Mary Keane, um, who was acting on behalf of the client to look for a company that could go in and, and very closely restore the glass houses to look as they originally did. But they were facing pretty substantial maintenance bills every year. So the, you're going to see a series of before. This is an auricular house, um, and the auricular house has been replaced down in the bottom right-hand corner. That doesn't tell as a stronger story as the one I'm about to show you now which is the inside. So left-hand top, all of the cast iron sections were taken out. The metal was classically reproduced to replicate the sections that were already there. And you can see it just looks like a well-painted wooden green version of the, of the job on the left. And, and this is now, I would suggest these are 19, 20, 20 years old now and they still look great uh, and very, very proud of that associator. And, and as, a, as a business, we have, um, we have now uh, rebuilt the Cherry House, top right-hand corner, five pit houses, and you can see that um, irrelevant sort of crop of toms in the, in the pit houses all the way through. That garden was under the management of Sue Dickinson, a name a number of people might know of as well. And she was uh, um, she ran a, 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 a Victorian kitchen garden in a in a very professional way, um, and it's funny how that garden, just like um, the Wisleys and the and the RHS gardens, tend to educate young people who move on out away from it. And and I recently met a, a young girl I saw 25 years ago in in the Cherry House down at um, Arundel Castle, and she's working there now. So our world's quite small, as we all know. Um, another job, um, Alitex. Again, I've been pretty blessed with my life. I've managed to, to travel the world and, and go to gardens of all sorts of um, um, uh, people, uh, whether they're um, uh, commercially savvy or just true gardeners. This is a, an estate, in the, a farming estate in the middle of Ireland. That's what we found. And the client was delighted with the end result, which was a, a replication of the glass house. Um, so there's a snapshot of um, some of our large specialist greenhouses. I will be showing the top left hand shot again, and, and you all may be fairly familiar with Lord Heseltine's estate. And, and Darren, bless him, has probably the head gardener's house to die for um, when Lord H and everybody else disappears off on a summer's evening, Darren can step out into his own kitchen garden from the, um, the gardener's cottage there. Uh, top right, um, challenging job in Nova Scotia some years ago. Um, we went over and built a greenhouse there and had to pull away for the winter and come back and finish it in the spring. Uh, just below that, uh, um, again, America. And then below that, two structures in, in kitchen gardens. And it's interesting, a lot of them a, a very close replicas of what was originally there. We've just offered our, our solution in metal. Again, that's, uh, that's a bigger shot of Thenford. Lovely gardens and, and very talented. That's, um, that's uh, I'm trying to think who designed that garden. Is it George? Um, I can't remember the, the design. Is it, George, is it George Carter? Yes, that's it. Well done, Annie. Thank you. Yeah, it was George Carter's work. Um, Dan Pearson Garden, very pretty garden down in, in um, in uh, Devon for a, a client who lives at, um, at Dartmouth there. And, and, and Dan's just a consummate professional at creating beautiful stone and planting surfaces everywhere. And it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely place down there. And of course it's got the climate, everything grows really quite well down there. Um, every greenhouse that Alitex builds, I keep 
sort of talking about how pretty they all look and how how they um how they are lovely to look at and how they are functional and how they are re replicating but they would be useless without a good set of well-made and um appropriate fittings to go within so when you when you commission an Alitex greenhouse in your garden, you want to be able to walk into it and, and enjoy all of the elements that make it work for you practically. So moving round the clock, uh, top left, a, a, a kind of nifty little uh, reservoir sunk underneath the bench with a pump on it, a hand pump, all the water runs into the tank. Nothing more than what the Victorians did. They would have called them dipping tanks. Uh, and we would, you would pump your water out into a watering can. Victorian staging that we found many years ago up in on Scottish estate and copied, uh, vine wire supports, potting shoes, um, shading, lifting handles down in the bottom here, tomato shelves, strawberry shelves, shelves set up above benching. None of this is rocket science if I took us back a hundred years. It's, it's what the Victorians did, um, but unfortunately it all decayed and it was not a long-term thing. Uh, cold frames, um, high-level shells, so those are sort of elements uh, that we put in to our greenhouses to provide a, a suite to complement the structure. Um, there's um, yours truly opening the cold frames which are to be honest with you a greenhouse in their own right one way or another. Um, it's another box attached to your greenhouse. We put these hit and miss slides in the wall so you get reciprocal heat flowing backwards and forwards. Uh, and interestingly, sometimes during the early spring, especially in April, you'd have got free heat. You'd have opened these hit and miss slides in the wall, keep the shut the cold frames down, and it would have been pumping heat up underneath the benches and helping all of your plants propagate. Um, uh, benches inside this is a three-quarter span interesting the lower one here was a grade one listed wall so we had to support it on posts uh, tiered shelving um, and I've got a business colleague John Lawson who I've worked with for 30 years utterly obsessed with m and &E, heating systems and everything and um, he's a great asset to our business because in our business we have what we call the quadrant which is um, the glass house, the fittings, the heating, uh, an MME as you would describe it, that's power and, and heat. And then obviously the, the, um, the, the building works to construct it. So we have all of those disciplines within our company, but John is our heating guru. And that bottom left shop is a Forbes listed American client who, who seems to have the, the, a battleship heating system set out for his 12 greenhouses. Um, we have cut our teeth on some very challenging projects over the last 20 or 30 years uh, and we continue to learn from each of them and we continue to um, develop the systems and the processes of design and transferring those processes back to the smaller structures which are relatable to many people. The one thing I have noticed about this last four or five weeks is that many of my clients are looking at their gardens and desperately trying to work out how to move forward with projects for small pretty glass houses that um, enhance their gardens. So all of those skills that we had in creating great looking buildings, the elements within those buildings are transferred continuously with our R&D teams down to the smaller greenhouses. Um, and that that's, that's gives us much pleasure, quite frankly, as, as some of the larger projects, which are a big wow factor projects, but the, some of our customers are so thrilled with um, building a pretty greenhouse and going out there. I'm married to one, and unfortunately, she didn't have a greenhouse until last year, um, and, and that seems very much cobbler's shoes, very bizarre. But now I go out there, and you can't move in it for, for plants and whatever. It is. Um, I think the, the phrase is we're going to need a bigger one. So there you go. That's a, a really rushed 20 minute spin on Alitex. Um, and I, I will now um, let you take this back, Annie. And thank you very much for giving me that moment to do that. I mean, it's a very small snapshot of, of what has been a, a very blessed career with me. Um, and uh, it's been fun.
Yeah. Chris, that was wonderful. We've had one Thank question you. already from <clears throat> Ramona saying, is planning permission required for a small greenhouse? Now, of course, we've got people, yeah. we've got people looking, uh, viewing from all over the world. But, um, you know, generally speaking, can you can you generalize on planning permission? Yes, of course. Yeah, well, it, it is down to the obvious, really. There is a there is a set of criteria, a designated criteria, and it, it runs into the standard processes. So first of all, if your house is listed, if your house is in an area of outstanding natural beauty, if your house is in a conservation area or in a green belt area, then it really doesn't matter at all. Of course, the last one is in, in, a, in a park, like the South Down Park or a national park. You will have to get planning permission if the structure you are building is over 10 square meters. So it's very restrictive. They all want to know uh, um, about the size of the green, certainly in the national park, but in within a listed building, um, the criteria is slightly different because you can be a couple of meters away from the boundary line, you can be behind the front of the house, you can be under 30 square meters, uh, you can be under four square meters to the ridge. So there's a bit of a meltdown of information coming from me at the moment. So I'm I'm really happy to to reply with a with a more concise uh, document because we have our own planning department at Alitex and I suppose to summarize the question it's different from site to site so permitted development is a bit more relaxed these days but that listed criteria and that ON outstanding natural beauty just poo poos the whole thing and you do have to go for through the processes I've got three clients this week that, that I have to do that so so Chris, can you talk a little bit more in detail about your role then as strategic director? So yeah. are, you, are you sort of sorting out all the gnarly stuff that, that's... Yeah, that's I, 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 that question, to answer that question properly, is it, it's the, um, and it's the white hair that's the dead giveaway, it's the yeah. old guy who's been around the business for many, many years, who understands my, our customers extremely well. Uh, and, and, and from my point of view, and they're going to have to probably stick some handcuffs on me and take me out to the car park and push me out the main gates. It's <laughs> disseminating the knowledge and experience that I've had for 50 years back down to the, uh, the youngsters joining the business. And we've got some great new youngsters joining our business. Uh, and, and, and that knowledge uh, is, is needed to be able to translate what we do understandably to our clients so uh, I mean many of our clients are very discerning many of our clients and this will surprise you don't know a lot about greenhouses and, and so they, they like the idea of it all but I, I have built greenhouses for um, pop stars racing car magnets and people like that who have woken up and smelt the flowers uh, I mean I can I can quote a particular formula of one guy who said, came over with his wife one day about five or six years ago and said, I can design a, a 600 million one, 600 million pound Formula One race car. But I actually get a quite a relaxing buzz. Um, so, Chris, um, sorry, sorry, we, we've got somebody called Susie. Yeah, who's, yeah, who's with, yes. All right, okay, lovely. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> we're getting muted. Back. Background noise. Carry on, Chris. Yeah. As I was saying, one of the interesting things about building fine structures is, and and additions to your garden or your kitchen or your bedroom or your areas where you want to add personal taste, is that um, you know what you like to look at, you know what you would like to, to spend some time doing, but you know nothing about it, and that's where I would say that. From an educational point of view, I've spent my life meeting a raft of people, Noel and Annie the same. Um, you meet so many people um, and just, again, slightly off piece. That's why I'm going to miss the end of this next month quite a lot. It is just a real blow. It's a bit... If you're, I was refer a you're referring man, to Chelsea Flower Show. Yeah, and if yeah. I was a football man, it, it's the equivalent of, of, of the Champions League final or... <laughs> FA Cup. It, it, and, and my next door neighbour is Alan, and, and Alan and I uh, often um, congregate on the Royal Night in the greenhouse, and, and it's such a buzz, it really is. And, and it, it, it's, it's my world, it's the world I love, and um, everybody that I've met throughout my life and learnt about other things other than just selling greenhouses 
are there at that show and it can be anybody um and um that's going to stop this year and it's yeah. uh, it's really well, it's, it's quite, quite sad. difficult Chris, and, and you on the um you're oh, no. talking about what well, obviously very kind of elite level glass yeah. houses yeah. um but uh, we have a more humble question here what is the price range for a small greenhouse could you give us uh, some sort of ballpark figure yeah, cool. Yeah, of course. So, so uh, we start with a little Hidcop greenhouse, which is nominally about um, seven and a half to ten square meters, and that greenhouse for the basic structure is in the region of about eleven thousand pound erected onto a base prepared by you. So, if you wanted to build a, a pretty little Victorian greenhouse in your garden of, of reasonable size, it's probably about a twenty k project all in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's actually was a related question about the minimum size greenhouse you'd recommend for a small family. Um, obviously, the sort of, I suppose it depends what they would want to use it for. But that, so that head cut model would be. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the smallest one we yes, do practically yes, because yes, you've yes. got to think about when you go inside. I mean, it, 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 and your and your garden is another issue. When yes. you build a greenhouse in the garden, the last thing you want is to have Crystal Palace suddenly at the end of the yes, garden. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But, but also, Chris, I think there is an element of, and I know, you know, when you well, I buy a van and I immediately think I should have got a bigger van. Yes, you know? yes absolutely. You Annie, buy yeah. a funky stereo and you think should have got the next one up. And, and so I always say to clients, you know, think about what you're what you want to grow now, but think about what you might want to grow. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it, yeah. there is thinking about that next step up. You can't really, you can't really extend a, a glass house, can you? So it's a bit not, of a... not really, because the, the care has been taking to yeah. get the proportions right yeah. initially. And I'm saying that, no, yeah, we have. We've gone in and, and built a, a, a glass house and with a view to being able to extend it to no, the that's latest. Good. No, that's good, so you can build in some flexibility. Oh, yeah. and, and you showed, in fact, earlier on, some, some of those rather fascinating, I think, probably rather early 19th century pit glass houses. And there's a question here, a lady saying, I had a, a colleague sunk his glass house partly into the ground. Um, so what kind of benefits does that provide? The, the initial outlay is pretty expensive. I mean, you can imagine nowadays digging into the ground and building structural walls into the ground. So it's quite an expensive thing. But the benefits of, of growing are obviously extremely good because it, you're obviously defeating the frost from getting into the greenhouse because mm. it's a much warmer surface below. I mean, pit houses are a much easier greenhouse to heat than a glazed structure that's up above the ground. I can imagine. But, everything, yeah. but no, everything's changing. I mean, I've noticed this winter that I've only had the heater on in the greenhouse about three times. Yeah. Um, yes. And it keeps, on, it keeps saying, well, it's going to happen again. We're going to get a cold spell. But this was an extraordinary mild winter. Yes. And, yes. and um, so yes. we always put provision in there. But um, yeah, sunken greenhouses and pit greenhouses, are, uh, uh, again, the Victorians did have a rule book. And they had a lot of people around and the, and, yes. and the states and, and clients and people doing things just just did it, didn't they? And, yes, and yes, yes. Nowadays, it's a it's a tough gig trying to to build something quite unusual and expensive. I suppose a pit glass house does. I mean, it does actually economise on glass. There's less structure. Yeah, you can see there the fibre. Uh, yes. I mean, we yes. haven't built many of them because I would say that the the base is probably just as expensive as the, as the yeah. glass. Yes, yes, you've got a lot of civil engineering. You could be moving out hundreds and hundreds of tons of soil yes, to get yes. down into the ground. So the trick is find a, a home with a pit house. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, we, 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 uh, a, a guest we had on Tea Garden Talk last week, Derry Watkins, who was this very uh, dynamic nursery woman at just north of Bath. Um, a long time ago, she and her husband, who's an architect, before uh, she came to Britain, uh, when they were in the of Washington State, I think, wrote a book about energy saving in glass houses. And it was a wonderful book. And it's long, long since out of print, but it was just full of so much information about things like pit houses, how to build yeah, yeah. a glass house that is really energy saving. I mean, it was way, way ahead of its time. Um, Do you know the fundamental, is, uh, one of the, the main clever ways of doing it, and not everybody's got it, but if you've got a wall, use it. If you've got yeah, a wall, absolutely. Yes, yes. Wall. I mean, it's, um, it, it, I've, I've done lots of experimenting over the years with my business partner, John, and, and actually you can find that a, a greenhouse wall in February, January, February, yes, March, yes. will be heating the greenhouse right the way through until midnight. Right, yes. Actual heat pouring back out 
oozing back out. Chris, Chris, are you finding now um, that, you know, back in the days, you know, the glass houses, the greenhouses, the, the vegetable garden, were, were tend to be divorced from the house and behind walls and yeah. kept separately. Yeah. Are you finding now more that the glass house and the greenhouse is, is becoming more of a focal point that's more yeah, centre question. stage in the design? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is a way of incorporating it into, um, I, I, the, we, if you reverse just a little bit out of that, in my years as a, as a, as a guy at Alitex, I have watched garden design become a far more prolific tool to helping someone develop a garden. I mean, garden designers in the 80s there weren't very many about and they were they were ladies that do lunch or whatever and <laughs> slightly controversial but you, you know what I mean now there's a there's a terrific profession of designers I mean we sponsor the the Society of Gardeners um, Oscars every January and there's a absolutely plethora of really talented people uh, and and so so what happens with these people now is is that they they look for ways to um, create theater within their designs and provide small buildings and, and small features that actually create a, a vegetable garden, a formal garden, a, 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 a fruit garden, and it goes on and on. So yes, I, I agree, clients are almost meeting you and Noel and anybody and saying, what do I need to put into my garden? What do you think I should do? And then you have to ask them, what do you want to do? What do you want to grow? What do you want? How do you want to use it? And if they say, should I have a greenhouse? Um, well, <laughs> well, I'm afraid you know what the answer is from me. So. Yeah, yeah. But um, I think very, it's that thing of that they used to be cut, sort of tucked away. And now I, I guess, yeah, 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 there yeah. Is, I mean, gosh, they're such beautiful things to look at. But now I've, I mean, I recently, and, and I think also this is another thing, you know, I'm I, not, Dan Pearson has the, the, you know, the wonderful clients and, slightly money's no object but you know with with the sort of clients that many of us have you know money is is very very important yes, aspect of budget. and recently i've had clients with modest small urban garden and a, and, a, and a client that you've you've wonderfully supplied a greenhouse recently it's her last garden she's in her 80s and the glass house was the focal point in the middle of it and it was it's her pride and joy and she looked straight out onto it and I think that's quite that's some that's quite a change, I think, isn't it, from having them kind of tucked away behind yeah. a, a fence. Well, I've, I've, said, I've said this for years, Annie, that um, if you had to apportion uh, value to your purchase, I would say that the actual Alitex greenhouse, there's about 20, 25 percent that has no more value than just the great pleasure it gives you to look at it. Mm. And actually, how many times do I wake up in the morning and actually um, look at it and say god oh, that looks great this morning it's, it's, it's a different view every day whether there's a there's a, a fog or a brilliant sunny morning it just adds great value to my garden I've, I've worked it into my garden as a focal point and everything's starting to evolve around it the planting and eventually it'll just nestle and disappear back into the back of the garden and i have three fields surrounding my house i have the great advantage of having seen thousands of, of, of ideas and I'm, I'm just uh, probably with beer money rather than champagne taste applying <laughs> it to my garden so we've, we've got a couple of good uh, rather got, technical uh, questions. the book I've just found oh yes book. yes I, yeah, yeah yeah 1978 uh, Derry Watkins and Peter Clegg oh fantastic um, well done you a uh, fairly obscure publisher in Vermont <laughs> uh, this is just so so ahead of its time and I just learned so much from this zillion yeah. years ago wow. uh, about about things like the thing about the wall orientation and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. A couple of questions. We've had a question about heating systems, for example, using high tech systems like, or at least more modern systems like uh, heat exchangers. Um, what, and um, what type of glass are you using? What type of well? glass? But also. Do you incorporate water capture systems um, or, or geothermal? Um, so, to, so to answer that question, I mean, it's big bucks putting in a, um, yeah. uh, some, sort of, uh, some sort of system that actually works on, on, on air or ground source heat pumps. They're, they're a lot of money and you never retrieve the value. I, I, I think the simplicity of the messages in the design 
in as much as that a glass house is a solar panel. Well, um, you can get into a cold greenhouse in January where it's been sunny all day and the temperature will be about 20 degrees higher than, than, than outside without any question at all. You can supplement it with um, fan heaters and tubular heaters um, and that, that works to keep the frost off them. Um, we have had some bizarre moments in our life. We built a greenhouse once for uh, a gentleman in Texas who wanted to have a um, European climate in his greenhouse. So he spent six figures on a, a pretty massive glass house and then filled it with an air conditioning unit. God. And he, he wanted to retain uh, 50 degrees outside and 20 degrees inside. I can't imagine the amount of dollars he was hemorrhaging oh, well, doing that Texas. but it's um, it's it, to, to get back to your question the small a smaller greenhouse you just want to keep it frost free unless you are an enthusiastic orchid grower or something like that you can get away with a fairly minimal amount of cost by way of a tubular heater and some fan heaters or something or a fan heater i mean my own fan heater has has used pennies in this winter and it's just grabbed those moments where it got down to minus five one night and just held it in that moment when the seeds are all beginning to come together, uh, held it just above freezing, two or three degrees. So, but air, air source, heat source, ground source, all of those sort of things we've done and biomass boilers. Um, the one thing I would advise everybody to, to not pay too much attention to is um, uh, using underfloor heating it's it's just a waste of time it really is i mean you get a the average output of underfloor heating is a couple of hundred watts per square meter you would need a you just wouldn't get enough heat out of it um it's nice and cozy on your feet but it doesn't do anything one of the great things about uh greenhouses is using the heat localized to where you're doing things so when i mentioned earlier on about a cold frame and how it has um, vent slides in the wall. Now if you've got a bench full of seedlings all the way along and you open one of these hit and miss slides underneath it and the cold frame itself is up at 80 or 90 degrees, it's piling heat through the wall underneath the bench and warming the roots of the seed trays. It's free heat and, and, and so it's just thinking about clever ways to, 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 to ensure a problem fleeces they're all work. they're all there aren't they just to protect that moment um, sorry another another question about orientation i was always taught east west <clears throat> to maximize the daylight is, is that correct yeah. i mean yeah. what would Absolutely. you say take the longitudinal face of the glass house the face with the most glass mm -hmm. and allow the sun to rise at one point in the east and set at one point in the west and then physically shade the whole of the southern aspect of the building that allows you to maximize the, the shade factor and reduce the scorch of the plants and the drying out of everything quickly. And we can shade everywhere on the greenhouse, but that's a good functional way to do it. It doesn't always work because you've got a beautiful garden. You want to put your greenhouse right at the bottom of the garden. It runs north, north, south. Um, we can, you could still do it, but it's just, if you can, always try and set your greenhouse east, west. Yeah. Yeah. Could I just sort of uh, take you on to a sort of elephant in the room in a way yeah, yeah. Uh, which uh, you your inspiration is, is very obviously the victorian era which was uh the golden age of glass house growing um i want to really ask questions about you know what what people actually grow in these things uh because the rate if you actually look if you look at victorian garden magazines or books the range of plants they grew then was phenomenal i mean you just come across genera after genus after genus which you just don't see it because they're simply extinct in cultivation um you know, insane numbers of ferns and orchids yeah, um, yeah, whole yeah. early era when there was very primitive heating systems and you had all these cape heaths i mean there were hundreds of species of cape heathers uh Tatton, and Tatton park is an example Tatton park they've got a beautiful fern house there yeah, that, yes and and no this all came about by nature of the fact that the victorians um had the ability to get a, a boat commission go over and find yeah. really rare plants and bring them back and then conserve them in their greenhouses but yeah. the, the people today will try and will grow everything i mean my greenhouse at the moment sue's growing absolutely everything in there mm -hmm. i was saying to annie last week that we we've got a footpath running between myself and alan's house and and 
Sue's got a list now. People have been putting in the letterbox for, um, could you grow tomato plants? Could you grow cucumber plants? Things like that. Mm -hmm. Because they can't get them from the garden centres. Sue's yeah, got yeah, this yeah. pretty greenhouse full of, to the, I mean, you, you can't get in the door at the moment. It's packed with it. We must have, um, I don't know, a thousand plants in there. It's colossal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, and Chris, are you finding the resurgence of indoor plants and the interest in indoor plants? Is that is that spilling over into your your clients and and their their desires? Do you think there's a you know is that do you recognise that's happening at the moment? Is that something? The only thing that I, I I would say is has never changed is is that a greenhouse is there to rejuvenate your plants that you put indoors, mm -hmm. because uh, what people will experience as they buy beautiful plants, um, not so much indoor plants, but they buy beautiful plants that they want to put in the house. They need to go back out and be um, given a boost in a wet, humid, warm greenhouse. Um, a conservatory plant becomes frazzled. Um, this sort of thing, this sort of thing works really well. Um, but um, normally I, I don't have any knowledge of people growing indoor plants in greenhouses i mean the only time i would have that would be in the in the perhaps the feature section within a greenhouse where a client would just fill it up with with temperate plants so that they can sit and enjoy it in a green lung so to speak and sit in there but um no i think uh, greenhouses is primarily there to rejuvenate and freshen up plants that you would love to have in the home and you can get away with that i mean the citrus tree is a classic example isn't it how many of us love that smell of a citrus tree yeah, this time of year which is just a breathtaking smell when you walk into a greenhouse um but it doesn't want to stay in there all year you you put it in there in in october and you bring it out next next week or the week after uh, and it starts to flourish outside and, and back it goes again i mean sadly we all don't live in the med where you can get your oranges and lemons quickly. It's, it's a tough gig doing it over here. Well, you mentioned orchid growing, which uh, was the, the kind of the core, really, of the whole Victorian yeah. glass house experience, that extraordinary Victorian obsession with, with, with orchids, even more than ferns. And, of course, the orchid has had, you know, in my gardening lifetime, this incredible democratisation you know, led by Phalaenopsis. Yeah, um, yeah. But then you see all these are because they because orchids are so easy to microprop, you know, all these uh, cattleyas and dendrobiums and Miltonias and things, oh, you can go none of which, of course, are as suitable for growing on in a home as as as, as Phalaenopsis. Um, I mean, is, is there still a, a big scene of people growing orchids in, in no. houses? Do you know, do you know Jim? Jim, Jim, Jim Durrant, no. No, no he's, he's, a, he's a really passionate guy. I don't know a lot about orchids. Um, I mean, I've never been completely fascinated myself by them. Um, but, but, I mean, there's a huge amount of enthusiasm for yeah. them. And, and they are very pretty. But, um, because they're so much cheaper than they used to be. They, they absolutely. Sort of absolutely. You know, that, yeah. that, that has brought down the price. And you can get, um, I've not sort of seen so much here, but certainly in the United States, I've been at flower shows where there are nurseries selling incredible ranges of you know, good yeah. species orchids, mm -hmm. all micro pops, not, not just the uh, rather schmaltzy hybrids. Mm. And they're very, they're very, very pretty, but um, yeah, they're, they're not my baby, so I'm afraid. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. And I think, I think we're all, I mean, you know, with people like Derry, who's, who, you know, nurseries like Derry's who sell a lot of plants, tender plants that we might have to overwinter. I think yeah. there are a lot of people now using, you say, tender salvias or plants like that, where, you know, in the winter they can protect them so I, I think I think our sort of um, plants um, catalogue is, is expanding I think we're all tending to stretch the boundaries a little bit and that's I agree. Fruit's, a big one. fruits a big one and many of my clients would love to grow a nectarine or a peach tree mm -hmm. or, or a vine I would advise about putting a vine into a small greenhouse because you won't have a greenhouse It'll just <laughs> come, out, uh, come like Hampton Court or you, you have to have staff to continually Yes, 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 yeah, uh, and and vi vines and and um, and and and, and uh, what's the other plant that just goes prolific in greenhouses? But anyway, vine is a is a is a bad thing to put in a greenhouse. It just completely shades it completely. Yeah. So, so Chris, um, I mean, we've got people watching from all over the world, and uh -huh. we've got a lot, a lot of designers watching. So a couple of things really is, I mean, if you could just t touch on, you know, how how do people who are who are not in the UK uh, work with Alitex and then also maybe a little bit of advice for 
a designer who's who's got a client who's you know thinks that you know what, how, how do you sort of put your arm around designers and and take them under your wing so a couple of questions yeah, a really good question i completely understand how a glass house will jeopardize a garden designer's presentation to a client and, and it's um, um there's always been in my young days at alitex the nervousness about introducing high value products to a design uh, and 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 slowly uh, um, and rather than instantly but to, i would suggest to slowly present that into the into the presentation introducing people internationally to alitex is not difficult we have websites and agents across the world we have an agent in america we have agents in in germany and we have agents in the scandinavian area so they're always on the internet to deal with but if anybody's got any uh, uh, need to talk to um, one of these guys just uh, contact myself on on chris dot sawyer s a w y e r at alitex.co.uk and uh, Annie I'm sure you can direct people uh, yeah. and I will, I will direct people to work yeah. for us internationally uh, but actually putting a project into a garden often requires um, some coordination with ourselves and we do this for nothing we are more than happy to engage with a designer and a client and 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 talk them through the process of of uh, a sense of place and purpose for the building that we're designing for them and it's very difficult to um to do that after the fact so i would welcome the opportunity from a designer showing the client what we do and we will come out and see them i mean even in america our agent will go and see them uh, yeah. but our own team we've got five or six guys um when the world settles down, we can get out again. They really love going to meet clients and building relationships and helping them with the knowledge and experience. It's been, it's been a big part of my life. Yeah. It's, it's well, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, we, you show those wonderful pictures of Ethrop, and I hope, I hope we can get to work with Ethrop. We've, we tried to, we tried to get something going there, but we always, in, in each of our, you know, annual programs, we try and incorporate an Alitex linked event somewhere with a wonderful glass house. So wouldn't I'm, I've got my fingers there, crossed. That, wouldn't that be lovely there? Yeah. And that, and the, one families, the families, I mean, there's been a bereavement in the family. Uh, right. and, 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 and the family's become more relaxed about um, showing uh, people. It, it is the best kept secret within horticulture that it is a garden of excellence. And, and, and I'm sorry it happens, it's just the way it is, but it is a, a very wealthy family with yeah. uh, actually done it so well. Yeah. There is talk of it, of, of things happening. Um, yeah yeah i think we, we we got we got some you know we've got some very positive comments from them this year but hopefully next year and of course last year we did do a day with um lord heseltine and yeah. um and and um his lovely head gardener is um uh you've mentioned his name oh, darren webster yeah. darren that's it lovely yeah we had a fantastic day there and maybe i i I, maybe Stephen Hester's garden, which is beautiful, which is a, a Tom Stuart Smith garden, which is yeah, a stunning yeah. garden not far away at Broughton Grange, which you may have heard yeah. of, which is a yeah. beautiful garden. Um, and there are a lot, lot of lovely gardens around that people, uh, it's very private, but they do allow moments and opportunities to share with the general public. Going back to earlier on, the Irish um, gardens are, are very special, if you know where they are. And there are some stunning gardens in Ireland. Oh, well, we'll have to pick your brains for some that we could do an event in Ireland because yeah, um, our, yeah. We, we, I've worked with Rachel Lamb over at um, Ballina Hinch Castle over on the west coast, where they have these kind of Caribbean beaches, but with uh, <laughs> western wind and sort of thing. <laughs> it's bizarre. You go over a hill and you see this crystal clear, beautiful beach but it's minus five and the, and the atlantic's blasting it it's but it is uh, the are anybody going to ireland avoid the middle go around the outside it is stunning i mean we've done very pretty projects in, in down in cork and kerry and all over the place it's a nice place Ireland, and lovely people if there's irish people listening. Dublin garden group the dublin garden group the dublin garden trail no I've, heard of of no I've not heard of them i mean it's um it, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working with Fingal Council on, on, on Shackleton at the moment, but um, yeah. I mean, your rules in Ireland are pretty tight at the moment. I don't think anybody's allowed to go out the door without a ticket. So, um, 
Yeah. It's, well, they've, they've, they've kept them, they've kept themselves pretty, pretty good compared with us. Next, listen, time is ticking yeah. on and um, we're going to have to draw this to a conclusion, but Chris, it's been really, really helpful. And I think yeah. it, it's, um, I think what's really nice to know is that Alatex is very supportive uh, with designers and, you know, if people, if people need handholding through that process that you're there to do it, which is great. Yeah. yeah. And we, we, we're a constantly learning business. I mean, both from a, a design point of view, but also, uh, I've said it a couple of times, from a, a sense of place and purpose and what we do. I mean, there's no point in us bringing a helicopter in and just dropping a building into a piece of land. It needs to be thought about. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the Victorians have done that for us already. So yeah. we, we, we just go in and, and, and replace it. But um, yeah. As you can see, I'm quite passionate about what I do, but yeah. I really enjoy well, it. That shows, and we're getting lots of lovely thank yous, and there's yes. thank yous from Ireland, lots of people from Ireland um, on today. Um, that was from Lynn Hughes. Thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was that was very welcome. welcome. No, so, yeah. So. Um, Stay, stay safe, everybody out there. We've got yes. an, another another talk tomorrow. One more tomorrow, yep. And uh, and we'll see you all then. But um, yep. ch cheerio to everyone at Alitex, and we'll we'll talk to you all soon. Yeah. Ciao. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.